Since the 19th century, um, people have talked about a difference between the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. And the idea roughly is that the Christ of faith is, is the Jesus Christians believe in, the Jesus we find in the Gospels in the, in the New Testament. The Jesus of history is supposed to be the Jesus that historians can find for us by digging back behind the Gospels um, and presenting, as it were, a figure who's different from the Gospels. And so we have a long history of people reconstructing the historical Jesus. And the way you can tell, I think, that that's a fruitless quest is that they're all different, constantly getting and different reconstructions of the historical Jesus. It depends on people's judgments as to what's authentic and so on, and all kinds of subjective factors. You come out with a whole lot of different Jesuses, so the method clearly doesn't work very well. I think the distinction between the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith is one that has actually collapsed in the best recent study of the Gospels. Um, the kind of work that shows that the Gospels are actually quite close to eyewitness testimony. So that what I think we can say we have in the Gospels is not the Christ of faith as distinct from the Jesus of history, but rather what I call the Jesus of testimony. Did Jesus really exist? If so, what can we know about him historically? For any Christian, the historicity of Jesus isn't merely a matter of curiosity. The Christian faith is dependent upon the incarnation, life, death, and resurrection of Jesus as historical reality. But how can we know if the Jesus of the Gospels is historical or legendary? How much we can know about Jesus historically depends on a given person's criteria for uh, what they will believe. There are some scholars, certainly um, the most skeptical fringe element of the scholarly world, who will say if it doesn't come from a non-Christian source then by definition they won't trust it. So that excludes a priori the four Gospels and it excludes uh, quite a bit of early Christian testimony, the rest of the New Testament, early second century writers. Even on that very rigid uh, criterion, there are a dozen or more references to Jesus in Jewish and Greek and Roman sources from the earliest centuries and you can put together a composite picture of Jesus uh, from those sources alone. There are about a dozen and a half extra-biblical non-Christian sources that say anything from a half a sentence to a paragraph on Jesus. The vast majority date within about 150 years after the death of Jesus and they report totally about 50 to 60 different items from the uh, life, preaching, death of Jesus, who he was, what happened afterwards, and even the earliest church. So 50 to 60 items that uh, demonstrate uh, that he was an early first century Jewish teacher who was born out of wedlock, whose ministry intersected with that of John the Baptist, who uh, gathered in his adult life uh, close followers uh, as other self-styled rabbis did, that his teaching regularly came into conflict with uh, conventional teaching of various Jewish leaders and that he was uh, ultimately arrested and crucified under the governorship in Judea of Pontius Pilate which narrows the dates to the time period between 26 and 36. Later rabbis who didn't believe in Jesus 
uh, acknowledged that Jesus and his followers did miracles, except they often attributed these to sorcery. The common early Jewish polemic uh, against uh, the Christian movement was that Jesus was a sorcerer who led Israel astray, which seems to be an acknowledgement that he worked what most people would call miracles. The issue not being did he do spectacular, unexplainable works of mercy, but uh, by what power were they accomplished? Was it from God or was it from the devil? There are other non-Christian historical sources which contain minimal independent information about Jesus' existence and even confirm aspects of the Gospel accounts. These include references from Thallus, Marabar Serapion, Pliny the Younger, Suetonius, Celsus, and Lucian of Samosata. Dated around AD 52, Thallus was one of the first secular writers who mentioned Christ. Julius Africanus is one writer who made an offhand reference to Thallus which may confirm the gospel account that darkness fell upon the land during the crucifixion of Jesus. Sometime after the destruction of Jerusalem by the Roman armies in AD 70, a Syrian by the name of Marabar Serapion wrote a letter to his son, a government official, encouraging him to pursue wisdom. Many scholars believe there is a definite reference to Jesus being compared to the philosophers Socrates and Pythagoras within the letter. He says, uh, remember the Jews who, who killed um, their wise king and the consequence of that was they lost their kingdom. Now very few people disagree that what he's referring to given the time of his writing is the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Um, what's up for debate potentially is, is who's the good, who's the wise king that, that uh, would have potentially caused the destruction of, of the temple in Jerusalem and by the Romans. Um, what we suggest is when you look at, to take Josephus and his account of that time and place, um, it's very difficult to propose who would have been proposed to be a good king who was killed by the Jews other than Jesus. Suetonius was a Roman historian, court official under Hadrian, an analyst of the imperial house. He stated in his life of Claudius that he banished the Jews from Rome who were continually making disturbances. Crestus being their leader. This corresponds to the book of Acts in the New Testament in which Luke recorded the same event of AD 49 as he wrote about the Apostle Paul's relationship with two other Christians named Aquila and Priscilla. Paul met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them. In another work of Suetonius, he wrote about the fire that swept through Rome in AD 64 under the reign of Nero. Writing in about AD 120, he said, Punishment by Nero was inflicted on the Christians, a class of men given to a new mischievous superstition. There were numerous people who, despite being executed, in a fashion that the Jewish scriptures said proved somebody was cursed by God. Nevertheless, uh, more and more people, Jew and Gentile alike, began to worship him. And one early Roman source describes how people began singing hymns to him as if he were a god. The non-Christian sources don't shy away from calling him the son of God or giving these titles, these early titles. They don't even shy away from reporting the resurrection. So some of these sources are pretty surprising in what they admit. Pliny the Younger was governor of the Roman provinces of Pontus and Bithynia in AD 101 to 110. In a letter to the Emperor Trajan, Pliny the Younger requested specific instructions about the interrogations of Christians whom he was persecuting. He said he made them curse Christ, which a genuine Christian cannot be induced to do. Pliny also notes that Christians worshipped Jesus as if he were a god. This suggests that both Pliny 
and the Christians he interrogated assumed that Jesus was a historical person. Part of what we're looking for is existence, uh, trying to uh, give a case, an argument, for those who go with a purely mythical Jesus theory and say that there's no evidence uh, really for the existence of Jesus beyond the Christian scriptures. And we think that uh, certainly Thales, certainly um, Pliny the Younger, uh, Suetonius, give us that. Lucian of Samosata, a second century Greek writer, warned his readers about the dangers of Christian teachings, never assuming that Christ was unreal. In the late second century, the philosopher Celsus wrote the first known full-scale attack on Christianity called True Doctrine. It is worth noting that Celsus taught that Jesus was a sorcerer or magician. If the story of Jesus were a recent legend, it seems obvious that ancient critics like Celsus would have argued this point instead of wasting time by offering counter-explanations for his miracles. These independent accounts, such as Celsus and Lucian, prove that even in ancient times, the opponents of Christianity never doubted the historicity of Jesus. So Jesus' miracles were widely known. Nobody tried to get around them and say that they didn't happen. They tried to explain them as saying these weren't from God if they didn't agree with him. But nobody denied that Jesus was known for that. And most scholars today acknowledge that Jesus was experienced by his contemporaries that way, including scholars who don't believe in miracles, but they believe that Jesus was experienced by his contemporaries as a miracle worker. Finally, there are two very important non-Christian ancient sources that provide significant information about the historical Jesus. One ancient non-Christian source that mentions Jesus would be Tacitus, the Roman historian. He's regarded as the most accurate of the Roman historians, and he's writing at the, at the beginning of the second century, around the year 115. To suppress, therefore, the common rumor, Nero procured others to be accused and inflicted exquisite punishments upon these people, who were in abhorrence for their crimes and were commonly known as Christians. They had their denomination from Christus, or Christ, who in the reign of Tiberius was put to death as a criminal by the procurator Pontius Pilate. This pernicious superstition, though checked for a while, broke out again and spread not only over Judea, the source of this evil, but reached the city Rome also. So from this, what we do is we get corroboration of the Gospel accounts and Paul that Jesus had been crucified by Pontius Pilate. Also, according to the Gospels and Acts, that after Jesus was crucified, that the Christians went into hiding. And so, therefore, you can understand why uh, Tacitus would say the Christianity was checked for the moment. And then he said it broke out again in Judea, where it started. Well, where is Jerusalem? You know, where is Galilee? It's, it's Judea. This is completely consistent with the early church following the Great Commission of Jesus to go into all the world, preach the gospel, make disciples of all peoples. So that's pretty neat. That's from Tacitus. Perhaps the most remarkable source is Josephus. Josephus was a first century Jewish historian. He doesn't have a, a, a bias against Jesus. He's not a follower of Jesus. He doesn't say he believes he's the Messiah. But he calls Jesus a sage. Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ, and when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men among us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold, these and ten thousand other wonderful things concerning him. And the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct at this day. Most agree that there's been some uh, Christian interpolation here. But it's, it's um, highly unlikely that Josephus, who was not a Christian, just a Jewish historian, that he would uh, say that this reference, indeed, if he was just a man, uh, that sounds like a believer. Or uh, to say that he virtually confesses he was the Messiah. 
Um, that's very unlikely. Or to, uh, it's unlikely that Josephus would have granted that on the third day Jesus rose. And so most scholars argue, for a variety of reasons, that those things have been interpolated. Now, there are some things that were added by later scribes, but scholars were able to reconstruct based on Josephus' style and so on. The, the part of Josephus is saying that was that was most likely original, and the scholar's reconstruction has been confirmed by the discovery of an Arabic manuscript of Josephus that has it in the same form that they had they had thought was most likely. Josephus says that Jesus, he's also talked about John the Baptist and James the brother of Jesus. He says that Jesus was a sage who was very popular with the people talks about uh, him being handed over by the, the elite leaders of his people. It wasn't all of his people, it was just you know certain people in Jerusalem who, who, who did this, handed over to the Roman authorities uh, who had him executed. But Josephus also says that Jesus was a worker of paradoxa. And that's a term that Josephus elsewhere uses for another prophet, for Elisha, referring to Elisha's miracles. So most scholars, um, uh, notably Geza Vermish, uh, a Jewish scholar at Oxford, um, have argued that Josephus acknowledges Jesus as a wonder-working sage. There is a second reference to Jesus within Josephus' Antiquities of the Jews, a passage which a large majority of scholars have regarded as authentic in its entirety. Festus was now dead, and Albinus was but upon the road, so he assembled the Sanhedrin of Judges, and brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James, and some others, or some of his companions. And when he had formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. There is much we can know about Jesus historically from non-Christian sources, that he existed and accomplished powerful works that even hostile sources acknowledged. On the other hand, it's really not uh, fair to exclude Christian sources because many people in the earliest decades of the Christian movement became believers, not because they were raised in a Christian home, but because the testimony about Jesus that was passed on to them was so credible that they converted. And so it's really unfair to exclude all of the early Christian writers who followed that kind of a pilgrimage because it was, it was the very evidence that they then go on to narrate that uh, led to their conversion. It's not that they began with it, somehow presupposed it, and were looking for reasons uh, to justify it. Neither is it appropriate to exclude the four Gospels a priori. It's sometimes said, ah, but they're books of theology and not just historical record, and that's certainly true. But then every ancient biography, every ancient history writer had an ideological purpose. Uh, the idea of recording facts just to have a comprehensive chronicle of something is really a modern invention of the last few centuries. Nobody in the ancient world would have, would have dreamed of bothering. And so uh, unless one is prepared to be suspicious on ideological grounds of every ancient source on every topic, in which case we would need to throw out our textbooks of world civilization, which nobody is doing. What's fair to do is to read the Gospels and assess them on their own merits. There are all kinds of internal criteria for authenticity that uh, make the Gospels impressive documents, um, and that could be another lengthy conversation. The primary historical sources we have for the life of Jesus are the Gospels and the letters which are now contained in the New Testament of the Bible. But are the New Testament writings accurate sources for the events they report? What are the conclusions of scholars and historians who examine the reliability of the Gospels with the same criteria by which all other historical documents are examined? 
You know, one thing that kills me is the way we play kind of fast and loose with the New Testament, but we don't treat the rest of history that way. For example, Alexander the Great has got to be one of the best known personages from the ancient world. The stories we have of Alexander, the accounts of Alexander, go from 300 to 450 years after his death. 300 to 450. And the best two, the two best known stories, biographies of Alexander are Plutarch and Arian, and they're both at the end of that range, 425, 450. But oh, we know so much about Alexander, and he went across the, from, from Macedonia east and to India, and he did this and he did that, and he conquered this, and his phalanx uh, configuration of troops, and nobody could stand against him. We're so sure we know all this data, and the sources are 300 to 450 years later. I mean, almost, almost totally. But the Gospels, using critic states now, I'm going to use critic states to show that they still don't, doesn't change anything. On the critic states, Mark is only about plus 40 after Jesus. Matthew is about plus 50 on the critic states. Luke about plus 55. And everybody puts John at about plus 65. Well, how bad is 65? 65 years later, way, way better than anything we have for Alexander. Scholars point out that the writers of the New Testament did not intend for their works to be considered fictional or legendary. Arguably, the Gospels of Jesus Christ can be categorized in the genres of ancient biography and historical monograph. The Gospels were ancient biographies. The majority of scholars now recognize that. And are surely right. I mean, when you look at the, the options in ancient literature, the kinds of genres, the kinds of writings that were available in ancient literature, somebody approaching the Gospels, it's, it's the story about a person who lived recently. Um, they didn't write novels about people who lived recently. In fact, usually novels were romance novels about fictitious characters. Not always, but usually. You look at all the options, and the Gospels fit biography in in all, all the important respects that people would look for for biography. Of the four gospel writers, one of them, Luke, was also a historian. Um, a biography that's part of a larger work, a multi-volume work that deals with other historical characters, would usually be seen as a, just a biographical volume within a multi-volume history. Well, the second volume of Luke's work, the Book of Acts, talks about the history of of the uh, early Christian mission, uh, especially how they, they went from being centered especially in Jerusalem to going out and reaching the Gentiles. And the texture of the, of the book of Acts actually changes as it's moving from one setting to another, from the Jerusalem church, um, the, 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 the piety of the Jerusalem believers worshiping the temple, to uh, a movement that's, that begins spreading among the Gentiles. And the way Luke chronicles it is, is very fitting for what most scholars consider, not all scholars again, but most scholars consider to be a historical monograph. It's interesting when you look at many of the details of, of Luke's uh, second volume, the Book of Acts, especially when it gets into the diaspora outside of Judea and Galilee, and it gets into the, the larger Roman world, there are so many areas where we can test him. We can test what he says against Paul's eyewitness accounts of the same things, like Paul being let down in a basket uh, from, from the walls in Damascus, um, to the mention of particular uh, authorities in particular cities. Um, the, the chief um, leader in Ephesus is called the town clerk, the Grammatus, uh, which is correct for Ephesus. The leaders of Thessalonica are called Politarchs, which was correct for Thessalonica. Novels didn't work at getting so many details correct. For example, when Paul is, is tried before Felix, the governor Felix, well, the, the time that Paul was there was the time that Felix was the governor. You know, somebody making these things up wouldn't have known that. Novels, again, didn't normally include that, that kind of uh, information. Moreover, Felix actually had three wives, not all at once, but he was married to three princesses in succession. And 
The one he was married to at this time was Drusilla, who is mentioned as his wife in the book of Acts. I mean, even if Luke were checking things out, he could have gotten the wrong wife. Um, Paul then appears before Festus, who is, in fact, the next Roman governor. And uh, Festus invites Agrippa II and Bernice to come hear Paul. Well, uh, Agrippa was the ruler of, a, of an area at that time. He was known for visiting uh, new officials coming into the area. And his sister Bernice, actually, she had been married. She had not lived with him for a long time. But just recently the marriage had broken up and Bernice had come to stay with her brother Agrippa. So, I mean, getting the right details at the right time. Moreover, Luke tells us up front at the beginning of his gospel that he's, he's not just making these things up. He gives a good preface for his historical work. It seems pretty clear that what we've got in the Gospels and in Acts is an attempt at, at serious ancient biographical and history writing. In so far as we can check them internally and compare them one to another and find little bits of information in Paul's letters or in Acts or in the rest of the New Testament or in some secondary sources, so far as we can check them, they seem to be accurate. Uh, they seem to be reliable witnesses. One of the internal evidence tests for historical reliability is the use of primary sources. Uh, a lot of history relies on testimony. And testimony is, is really, it's a kind of, it's a form of human knowledge. Um, alongside various other forms, but it's the form of human knowledge when you know something because someone else has told it to you. And it's not something you can verify for yourself, otherwise you wouldn't need to be told it. It's basically something that you rely on someone else to know. And we do this all the time in everyday life. An enormous amount of our life is based on believing what other people say in one way or another. Um, and we don't have to be credulous, uh, about this. We don't have to believe everything everyone says. You know, we have reasons for trusting some people, not trusting other people. Um, we have reasons for trusting some things that people say and not others. We can be critical about this. We're not stupid. Um, but nevertheless, we rely um, a great deal of the time on things that we cannot verify for ourselves that other people say. Uh, one thing about the Gospels, of course, is that the, the events they are relating are events that the people who reported them regarded as supremely significant events. They're events that had changed their lives, um, affected everything about their own lives, and they certainly thought of them as kind of world-changing events, enormously important, unique kind of events, events in which God was involved in a special way. If there's something special about the events, if they're, as it were, out of the ordinary events, a lot of things that happen in history, we can think, oh, well, yes, of course, that's the sort of thing that happened to me yesterday, or that's the sort of thing I read about in the newspaper. Um, but sometimes in history you come across, as it were, virtually unparalleled events, the sort of thing you haven't got immediate experience of yourself. So how do you deal with those? I think another really good example of this, it's a very different sort of event, but another example of a kind of unique sort of event in, in modern history is the Holocaust in Nazi Germany. This, I think, is, is again an event where people who write about the Holocaust are tremendously dependent on the testimony of Holocaust survivors. And if we didn't have that testimony of Holocaust survivors, if we just had sort of the external facts that you could get from the uh, German records and so forth, we would have no idea of what it was really like. You know, you absolutely need uh, the insider testimony, people who went through it and experienced it. That's what you need for a, a unique sort of event. And that's why I think um, the fact that the Gospels come to us from people who are insiders, who were with Jesus, who were close to Jesus, who experienced these things themselves, actually makes them much more valuable as testimony to, to what was really going on. The Apostle Peter wrote, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. In John's gospel, we read, And he who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, 
and he knows that he is telling the truth, so that you may believe. Two, if not three, of the four gospel writers were actually present at some of the things that they record. And uh, Matthew was, John was, uh, Mark's gospel is considered to be Peter's gospel, according to earliest traditions. Peter's the one who's the authority behind Mark's gospel. Luke, of course, doesn't claim that he was present for any of the events. He probably wasn't a Christian and wasn't in Palestine early enough to see Jesus. But at the beginning of his gospel, he said that he had opportunity to interview eyewitnesses and, and he had a thorough knowledge of the subject. So he was a reliable witness. Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the exact truth about the things you have been taught. Luke was writing historiography. He, he tells us in his preface, and novels didn't have these kinds of prefaces, that, a historical preface. I mean, there's one novel that I think of that has a preface that tells you how he made the story up, <laughs> uh, Longus. But, but Luke says that he's going to detail the events that were fulfilled among us. Well, that's the language of historiography. Also, Luke tells us about the kinds of sources that were available to him. The first four verses of the Gospel of Luke, often referred to as his prologue or preface, actually give us the most detail of any passage in the four Gospels of what one of those writers thought he was doing. First of all, he tells us that many have undertaken to, to write an account of these, these things among us not just one or two, uh, not just the sources that we still have available today, like Mark or um, the, the material shared with Matthew, but there were many sources available to Luke. Today we can't duplicate that, you know, but we have somebody who was around back when those sources were available, just like when Suetonius or Tacitus, Roman historians, write about events. Sometimes they tell us their sources, sometimes they don't, but we know that they had sources. So we have Luke, who was not an eyewitness of, as far as we know, anything in his gospel. He comes on the scene midway through the book of Acts, interviewing and hearing second and third hand from people he calls eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Exactly what ancient historians uh, set out to do wherever possible. Luke followed the ordinary practice of ancient historians, what we now call oral, oral history, which is going to the eyewitnesses. And probably Luke was collecting his traditions over a considerable period. You know, it's not something he thought about doing and then finished it in six months' time. It's something he would have planned. So maybe by the time he'd finished his gospel, there weren't many eyewitnesses still alive. We're not sure when he wrote. Maybe that's the case. But he'd probably been collecting his traditions um, for quite a while. And maybe some of his traditions he got from written sources. But he would have done that because he knew they came from good authorities. Maybe some of his traditions he got at second hand. But again, he would have quizzed people. He would have interrogated them. He would have checked his sources, made sure he was relying on, on good sources. But the key thing is eyewitness authority was the key thing. Once again, Luke intended his gospel to be a factual account based on the testimony of eyewitnesses. When he refers in his preface to those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. Servants of the word appears to be a, a fairly technical term for people in Jewish, Greek, Roman circles alike who were charged with the careful transmission by word of mouth about some important event or figure. The, the word oral tradition can be uh, rather misleading because it's often used rather vaguely. Some historians who use oral sources, say for modern African history where oral sources are 
still a very key ingredient, would distinguish between oral history and oral tradition. And oral history basically is within living memory. It's where you get things from the eyewitnesses. Oral tradition is what has been passed down over generations. So that's a key distinction. And in the case of the Gospels, strictly speaking, we're dealing with oral history because the time period is within living memory. Some of the scholars who worked on the Gospels at the beginning of the 20th century, the people called the form critics, who really introduced the notion of oral tradition into Gospel scholarship, an enormous influence. Their models for oral tradition were things like European fairy tales, which are passed down over centuries probably, you know, um, and passed down anonymously and moreover were, were never meant to be history. They were always fairy stories. They were always entertaining stories which you told because they were entertaining. Quite the wrong model for what was happening in, in the case of the Gospels. We're not do, dealing with generations, let alone centuries. We're dealing with a quite short period in which the eyewitnesses were still available. So I think oral history is a much closer analogy to what the Gospel writers were doing, rather than talking about them as recipients of oral tradition, which sort of creates the impression, you know, that a long period in which all kinds of things happened and traditions passed from mouth to mouth um, wasn't like that. The oral traditions of a people, let's say early Christianity, become absolutely essential to defining for each individual who I am, who we are, and what our purpose in life here is. And so what uh, we now realize, I think, what we have to acknowledge, is that early Christians would have held their oral traditions as identity forming, and therefore would have had a, a, a real concern to preserve and have custodians around that preservation taking care with her, of their oral traditions. If the Gospel of Mark was written, uh, say 25, maybe even 30 years after uh, the ascension of Jesus, then you've got uh, probably uh, 10,000 retellings of the same material by Peter until Mark wrote it down. And so what happens is you get these early Christians to start telling the stories of Jesus and they're doing it both in the community of other believers and before unbelievers. In the telling over and over and over again, they are principally doing it for several years in Palestine. Consequently, you've got other eyewitnesses who are observing them, hearing them, and correcting them if they make mistakes. And so you have this memory in community that is uh, extremely impressive for the New Testament. You don't have these people telling the stories of Jesus in isolation, uh, without accountability to other believers who knew exactly what happened. So this idea of eyewitness is the linchpin that connects the current presentation of the gospel message back to Jesus himself. And it seems that as long as eyewitnesses lived, um, you know, till the till the, the death of that first generation, maintaining that connection was absolutely essential to them. In sum, the oral proclamation had a stable core that was retold in public and private settings, safeguarded by memory and community, and confirmed by eyewitnesses. This evidence points to a strong and reliable oral history behind the written Gospels. But everywhere in antiquity, far more than, than today in the West, people were, were very careful with oral memory. What I've noticed when it comes to these cultures, uh, in, in modern times even, is uh, that the Middle Eastern mentality is so different from the modern Western mentality. Uh, the times I've spent, for example, in Turkey, uh, we uh, have met Muslims there. The country is 99.8% Muslim. These Muslims have memorized the entire Quran, which is about the size of our Bible. It's, it's a big book in Arabic, and yet they don't know a word of Arabic. They don't understand it at all. So all of it is meaningless sounds, and they've memorized the whole thing. Now, for a Westerner, that's, that's impossible. And, and also, it seems senseless, but that's what they've been able to do. There have been 
missionaries who have gone to Middle Eastern uh, cultures and uh, when they, when they, sometimes they'll tell, say, a parable of Jesus or a, a story about Jesus from the, from the Gospels. And then the next day, the children, little kids, would we repeat it, having heard it once, verbatim. It's, it, it's a different mindset. With the, the coming of the printing press and how that's impacted Western civilization, and now with the internet, our ability to memorize has shrunk dramatically. But these Middle Eastern cultures and the ancient cultures, and especially ancient Jewish culture, learned how to memorize and lived by memorization extensively. You had people, uneducated people. Some people say this is only the literate. No, you had uneducated bards who, who couldn't maybe read or write, but they could recite all of Homer's Iliad and Odyssey from memory. You had uh, educated people who, who could perform feats that we would consider phenomenal. One guy went into an auction and listened to every item that was sold and at the end of the day he could repeat back every item that was sold, the price for which it was sold, the person to whom it was sold without using any notes. Another person went to a poetry recitation, heard the poem being recited and as the person uh, finished the poem the guy in the back said, hey, that's plagiarism. That's my poem. You stole my poem. And, and, and the guy up front was like, well, uh, you know, he was embarrassed uh, because he didn't know what to say because the guy who had been reading the poem didn't know it from memory. The guy in the back, he said, I can repeat it from memory. And he repeated it from memory. And then he said, ah, just joking. I just wanted to show you how good my memory is. So there were people who could memorize things as they were hearing them. Incredible feats of memory. But memory was particularly emphasized in academic settings, from elementary settings on up. For example, the rabbis would recite uh, a lesson and their students uh, that were being trained uh, in the rabbinic uh, schools had to recite the same exact words sometimes 500 times before they could go on to the next lesson. So there's very strong demands on the oral performance of the students. Disciples of teachers were supposed to remember what their teachers taught them. They could pool their memories afterwards and often did. If the disciples of Jesus did not accurately remember the substance of a lot of his teaching, that's not saying they remembered every detail, but if they didn't accurately remember the substance of his teaching, they were quite unlike what we would expect for any disciples in the first century. It seems far more likely, based on all the evidence we have, Jewish evidence, Greek and Roman evidence, you know, all the evidence we have from antiquity. Um, th there are areas where we don't have evidence, but we have a whole lot of evidence, and, and you put it all together, it suggests these people would remember things. Many reasons could be given for the delay of the written Gospels, but even thinking about this question in these terms is perhaps considering it from the wrong perspective because oral proclamation of the gospel was paramount in the apostles' earliest motives, it might be better to ask, why were the gospels written at all? The gospels were not written immediately after the ascension of Jesus, and uh, there are a number of reasons why that is the case. Uh, perhaps the most important is that these early disciples believed that Jesus would come back very, very soon, imminently, at any moment, and uh, so the parousia, or the coming of Christ, was uh, prominent in their minds. And consequently, they did not uh, want to put into written form uh, the, the stories of Jesus. They were spreading the news about him to the entire ancient Mediterranean world, so much so that the news got to Rome within 15 years, and uh, the emperor had to kick out the Jews because they were uh, causing all sorts of problems uh, with uh, the Christians because they were following one named Christus or Christos or Christ that is. And uh, so there was this strong oral tradition due to the impulse of evangelism and mission that kept them from wanting to reduce it to writing. As soon as you reduce it to writing you are assuming that this has to last beyond that generation and, and affect the next group typically. And uh, only after uh, a couple of decades did they come to realize Jesus might not return soon, and consequently they would have to reduce this to writing.
we believe that there never was a purely oral uh, tradition. Much like the orally, orally oriented world of the ancient world, all over the place, there was an interesting mixture of dominantly oral, but uh, some literary weavings within that. Uh, Luke is a highly educated, very competent person with regard to first century literacy, and we have no reason to believe that others like Luke weren't involved at this uh, in this movement from, from quite early on. Um, even if we just take Matthew as reflective of the kind of people that could be in Jesus' early movement, someone like Matthew working as a tax collector would have had to have a trade literacy to be able to, to keep books and things like that. And, not surprisingly, the Christian tradition claims that Matthew from very early on wrote notes about Jesus and his teachings. Um, the whole category of notebooks is something that we now know was a live option for people in the first century. So we now have historical precedent and um, actual literary evidence coming together that that's what was going on in some of the early Jesus context. We have traced the oral tradition behind the Gospels to the written Gospels and have seen that they are reliable as eyewitness testimony to the person and work of Jesus. But what if the copies of those written Gospels were corrupted and the original text was lost in translation? Depending on who you talk with, there are all kinds of objections to reliability of the Gospels, but some of the uh, more commonly heard ones uh, include, hasn't the Bible been copied so many times and then translated into uh, so many different versions that we simply don't have any confidence as to what uh, the writers originally said or meant and usually that kind of a question comes uh, from people who really aren't aware of the thousands of manuscripts available and uh, the kinds of variants and differences most of which are extremely minuscule that one finds among them. The number of New Testament manuscripts that we have today uh, is a vast quantity. As of August 2013, the grand total of Greek New Testament manuscripts stands at 5,838. This is more than 1,000 times the manuscript data for the New Testament than for the average Greco-Roman author. Uh, that's uh, so incredible. It's, it's, it's almost uh, incomprehensible when you compare it to any other ancient literature. Uh, that comes to more than 2.6 million pages of manuscripts. It's, it's a huge amount. That's just in Greek. Then we have the New Testament, because of the evangelistic motives of the early um, uh, Christians to spread the gospel in areas where Greek was not the primary language, the New Testament got translated into Latin, into Syriac, into Coptic, into Georgian, Gothic, Armenian, Ethiopic. We have thousands of copies in those languages. We don't know the exact number. They have not yet been tabulated. In Latin alone, we have more than 10,000 copies of the New Testament, handwritten copies of the New Testament, that started to get translated in the second century when uh, the gospel spread west. In Syriac, hundreds, perhaps even a couple thousand, same with Coptic. Uh, our, our best guess on these versions, our best conservative guess on these versions is that we have at least 15,000 handwritten copies. The very best classical author in terms of existing manuscript copies is Homer. Manuscripts of Homer number less than 2,400 compared to the New Testament manuscripts that are approximately 10 times that amount when translations in other languages are included. Now. When you look at all this material, you say, okay, you got 5,000, almost 6,000 for the, the Greek New Testament, and you got maybe 15,000 for these other languages. Surely those manuscripts aren't complete. That is correct. There's only 60 complete Greek New Testament manuscripts that have Matthew through Revelation without any gaps because uh, they haven't fallen out somehow. However, the average Greek New Testament manuscript the average is more than 450 pages long. And so you start 
multiplying the, these copies, we have the whole New Testament uh, reproduced in these manuscripts hundreds and hundreds of times over. But when you compare that uh, to other ancient Greek literature, the average Greek or Latin author has fewer than 20 copies of his writings still in existence, written in any language. You stack those up, it's maybe four feet high, and usually far fewer than 20 copies. It might, the average is probably like four, five, or six. The New Testament, you stack up those manuscripts, it's over a mile high. Four feet high, a mile high. Now, if you had a magic wand, and you could wipe out all of the New Testament manuscripts in the world in one fell swoop, the Greek ones as well as all the ancient versions, we still would not be left without a witness. And that's because of the ancient church fathers. These patristic writers wrote commentaries, they wrote homilies, uh, theological treatises, all sorts of things, and these folks did not have the gift of brevity. We have, uh, there's a place in Beuron, Germany, where they have been tabulating these, these quotations and allusions to the New Testament for, for decades. And uh, a couple of decades ago, they came up with more than one million quotations of the New Testament by these church fathers. We have, again, the whole New Testament virtually reproduced many times over just in the writings of the fathers. So the problem that we have with New Testament textual criticism is not that we have a dearth of data, which is the problem that all other ancient literature faces when it comes to the, uh, reconstructing the text. The problem we have with New Testament textual criticism is we have an embarrassment of riches. Obviously, when you're doing New Testament reliability, the earlier the sources, in general, the earlier the sources, the better. And so we want New Testament evidence that's as close to the events as possible. The oldest manuscripts of the New Testament we have come from the second century. Uh, there are a minimum of four of them, and uh, perhaps as many as 12. These, these are extraordinarily difficult to date exactly. In fact, if there is not a date written on the manuscript, and we do have that in, in later centuries, the way we date these manuscripts is by a comparison of handwriting, size, features, all sorts of different uh, issues called paleography, trying to determine the, the date and the provenance and things like that of a manuscript. Our earliest New Testament manuscript is most likely P52, uh, which was the 52nd papyrus uh, of the New Testament that was published. Uh, it's uh, from Egypt. Uh, it's uh, written on uh, both sides, which means it's an early book form or a codex form. And uh, it's got John 18, 31 through 33 on one side and John 18, 37 through 38 on the other side. Uh, the date of this is uh, somewhere between 100 and 150. So the first half of the second century is what most scholars have, have come to uh, believe about it on a number of uh, very important uh, uh, bases, especially the comparison of this manuscript with other early dated manuscripts. The two best manuscripts that compared to this in terms of the look of the, of the text were, was one that was written in AD 94 and the other one that was written in 127. So these come closest to what this manuscript was like. And you say, well, gee, isn't that really subjective to date a manuscript by handwriting? Well, it is if handwriting doesn't change, but handwriting does change over time. And the irony is that it's the later New Testament manuscripts written in the Middle Ages from the 10th to 13th century that are the hardest ones to date by century because that handwriting got stabilized and it didn't change very much. But even today, we can, we can tell this, we can even tell this with printed books. If you read a book that says cooperation in it and it has two little dots over that first O, that's called a diaresis. You won't find that in modern English. You'll find it in books that were written 30, 40, 50, 60 years ago. And if you see that, you say, this is old. If you see the handwritten documents, the, of our founding documents for the United States, the Declaration of Independence, the uh, Constitution, and if you go to the uh, Archives Building and see that in Washington, D.C., you'll notice that the handwriting is done in such a way that is quite different from what you were taught in school and in, in later uh, uh, centuries. And so you'd say, if you were to just look at that manuscript, not even know what it is, you'd say, this is old, this is very old, this is probably well over 100 years old. That's a lay person who's guessing at that. When you start doing these, these comparisons, what you discover is a certain letter formations, certain what's called ligatures, where they join 
two letters like in the word archaeology it used to be spelled with uh, a and e having sharing one side and uh, in later uh, printed text that's drops so that's called a ligature when you join two um, uh, letters together those follow a certain pattern in terms of chronology so there's ways to date these manuscripts usually we can date them within a period of about 50 years the earlier manuscripts especially so p52 is almost surely no later than AD 150 and closer to AD 100. It may even be in the 90s. Uh, extremely early manuscript, very, very important, even though it's tiny. The significance of this is that European scholarship for 90 years since 1844 had uh, argued that John's Gospel had virtually nothing to stay, say of any historical value. And uh, when Roberts finds this small fragment, that changed everything. Uh, even though it's a small part of John's Gospel, it was evidence that John's Gospel was much earlier than they had thought. And consequently, it opened up the door for historical reliability. The earliest bodies of papyri are the Chester Beatty papyri and the Bodmer papyri. And those two sets together are between a half and two thirds of the entire New Testament. So we have papyri from that early time, which would be in the second century, 100s, and just slightly later. In addition to these early papyri, we have what's called Tatian's Fourfold Gospel from about 180 AD, and it's a side-by-side -side Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Uh, 180 is still less than a century after the close of the New Testament, have all four Gospels. And so when you hear somebody say, well, you can't tell what the original New Testament actually said because uh, we don't have the originals and we're waiting a long time before we get any copies. I say, you know, if that's the case, then we might as well just shut off everything we know about the ancient world because we're basing our knowledge of the ancient world on manuscripts that come hundreds of years later. The average classical author, uh, his, his uh, existing copies come at least half a millennium after he wrote. For the New Testament, we're waiting decades. It's, it's an amazing difference. Most scholars of classical literature, when they do textual criticism, they have to reconstruct the text because of gaps in the manuscript testimony, where they've got nothing there and they don't even know what's written. Sometimes they just say, we have no clue. For example, you've got uh, uh, 135 books on Roman history that Livy wrote and we only have 42 of those left. So they can't do the gaps, they just say, we don't know what's in those. Um, but even with the books that they do have, there's long gaps in a lot of this, this material. For the New Testament, that's not the case. We have so many manuscripts, and they make a coherent message that there's either absolutely no reason or virtually no reason to come up with conjecture in any place where you're saying, here's what I think the original text said. We don't have any manuscripts that say that. So we really are in a position to say we know what... Uh the New Testament writers originally wrote with an astonishingly degree, high degree of accuracy. Um, and people who claim it's corrupt simply haven't studied the matter. There's some who like to think that the copying of New Testament manuscripts is akin to the telephone game where somebody whispers a, a, a brief story in somebody's ear and it goes down the line until you get down to the 10th, 15th person and he spits it out and it's all garbled, it makes no sense. The telephone game is meant to be uh, one in which a story, which is not a particularly straightforward story, and it's only whispered and only once, is garbled. Otherwise, if everybody says it's exactly the same, it's not any fun, it's a, it's a parlor game. We, we, do, we do that at parties. The copying of the New Testament is not at all like the telephone game. First of all, it wasn't copied orally, and even if it had been copied orally, that is, if people just recited this over and over again down the, down the uh, centuries, they would have done a far better job of it than what we do in, in modern society, as we've talked about, about oral culture. But it's copied by, by writing it out. And you have these scribes who are copying out a text, and it's not just a single line of transmission where you can only interview the last person in that line. That's not the case with the New Testament. We have multiple lines of transmission. So maybe the original documents were probably copied 10, 15, 20 times perhaps. And then they go out uh, through various areas in the ancient world. 
and they're copied again, people recognize, well, there's some mistakes here. I know this is not what all the manuscripts say. So some of these people go back to the site, read the original, or at least look at earlier manuscripts, and there's comparisons. And so you get these manuscripts that are flooding the Mediterranean world. And not only is that happening, but we don't just look at the last generation of these manuscripts. We can go back and interview a guy from the 15th century or the 10th century or the 5th century or the 2nd century to see what he had to say. So to compare the copy of the New Testament to the telephone game, the only comparison is that there's some copying going on and that's it. The Gospels present Jesus as performing incredible miracles and rising from the dead. In Matthew's Gospel, we read that Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the Gospel of the Kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. The anti-supernaturalist bases their thinking on the presupposition that God has not intervened in history and miracles cannot occur. Therefore, regardless of how convincing the evidence might be, the anti-supernaturalist will reject any claims of miracles recorded within the Gospels, particularly the resurrection of Jesus. The first question you always have to ask when it comes to the resurrection, or any miracle for that matter, whether found in the Gospels or some other document is, are you open to the possibility of the supernatural? You know, it's interesting that, that critics like to say to Christians, uh, yeah, but you've got miracles in your Gospels, or you guys believe in miracles today, or, or and, and that just throws out so much of what you do, etc., etc. And one of the first things I want to say is, you know, that throws things out from your perspective. That thro throws things out naturally. Of course miracles are very, very rare as natural events. Uh, duh, they're not natural events at all. But when you make that criticism as a skeptic, you're assuming your worldview. We have a naturalistic worldview that prevails in our society, especially in the academy and they assume there is no supernatural. And obviously the Bible records supernatural things. So if, you're gonna, if your starting point is there is no supernatural, then all the reports of supernatural things have got to be myths or legends or lies or something like that. What evidence do we have that miracles happen today and that miracles happened in history? Today, when people to start with the premise that miracles don't occur, often without knowing it, they're echoing the arguments of David Hume. David Hume was a philosopher a few centuries ago who came up with an argument that, to, um, to just boil it down very simply, uh, a longer argument, David Hume argued that we can't trust any witnesses who claim miracles because there's no witness credible enough to surmount the prejudice against miracles because essentially we know that there are no credible eyewitnesses for miracles. If that is not a circular argument, I don't know what would qualify as one. One of Hume's arguments rests on natural law. He says that miracles are a violation of natural law. Now Hume got a lot of his arguments from earlier deists who have mostly been forgotten today. He was trying to argue against um, Christian apologetic use of miracles, but arguing that miracles are a violation of natural law just speaks completely irrelevantly to that question, because nobody, no theist, no Christian, believes that <clears throat> miracles uh, are, are a violation in the sense that God is breaking his own law. God is not subject to those laws. Moreover, Hume's conception of natural law depended on the physics of his day, which is very different from the physics of today. Today, usually people view natural law as descriptive, rather than saying what can or cannot happen, rather a description of what does or does not happen. But even in Hume's own day, 
the very people who were designing the ideas of natural law believed in miracles. It wasn't the scientists who disagreed with miracles. It was Hume's skeptical philosophy. People have often used the argument from analogy. Um, this basically goes back to David Hume, but it was formulated more formally maybe a century or so ago uh, by Ernst Trolch. He argued that the kinds of events that don't happen today, we have no reason to believe that they happened in the past. This argument has since been turned on its head as scholars have begun to wake up to the reality that actually we do have a lot of eyewitnesses claiming what they believe and many of us believe are miracles today as well. If we deny the existence of miracles a priori without looking at the evidence, that does not follow the scientific method. The scientific method is inductive, it looks at the evidence. Some people say modern science has disproved it. It's done nothing of the kind and scientists are much more modest today than they were a generation ago, although some still make unprovable claims. Science by definition studies the repeatable. Miracles by definition are not repeatable, at least not in identical fashion, and therefore the, the two domains really don't conflict with each other at all. Nobody actually believes only what is replicable. Nobody only believes what can be determined by experimentation. If somebody is dead and you want to find out how they died, you, you can't go back and kill them again. Uh, repeat, repeat the experiment to, to see how they died. Forensic science works in a different way. Historiography works in a different way. Miracles are by definition unique. They're not replicable. So consequently, they don't end up in medical journals very often, especially when um, there's a theistic explanation associated with them, which is kind of normally not going to survive the peer review process among those who don't like those kinds of explanations. But what we can do is go back where miracles are reported to occur and check them and see where we can get the documentation. Science is limited, but science can also look at evidence and say, okay, this person was sick with this before. This person, after prayer, stopped being sick with this. Um, how often does this happen? So science can ask questions like that. But the question of the interpretation of science, the question of how we evaluate the evidence has to go beyond that. And there, to a great extent, people's presuppositions come to play. If the supernatural has ever occurred, it has occurred in history. And the knowledge of the supernatural event would be the same as the knowledge of any other event, witnesses who saw it. If there's reliable witnesses who saw an event, then we have no reason to doubt that event, just because it involves forces that we might not be personally familiar with. We're not against the historical critical method at all. We just think it should be more critical. A historical critical method that a priori rules out miracles is not critical enough because it's not critical enough of its own um, uh, ethnic perspective, its own uh, limited worldview, its own limited experience. Uh, so let's, let's apply the historical critical method, but let's be really critical of it and be critical of the, of the possibility of our, our own limited worldview being uh, at times erroneous. If one is at least open to the possibility that there might be a God who on rare occasions for his purposes works in ways other than the normal scientific laws of cause and effect which he also created then the question for the resurrection or any other miracle, whether in Christian documents or any other documents, is how strong is the evidence? There was a survey done of physicians in the U.S. and well over 70 percent of them said that they believed that miracles still occur today as they occurred in ancient times and what was most remarkable was that 55% of them said that they had seen 
treatment results that they considered miraculous. There was a Pew Forum survey done, I believe in 2006, in which they studied Pentecostals and Charismatics. I'll come to other Christians in a moment, but in, in ten nations. And in these ten nations alone, among Pentecostals and Charismatics alone, about a couple hundred million people who claim to have witnessed divine healing. In those same ten nations alone, you take the other Christians um, in the survey who don't claim to be Pentecostal or Charismatic. About 39% of them claimed that they had witnessed divine healing. Some of these accounts are extraordinary. And in, in a lot of cases, you have people who were not Christians at the time that they witnessed these things and became Christians as a result of these things that were so different from their usual expectations. About 10 years ago, there was a uh, a source from within the China Christian Council, which is, I think, affiliated with the Three Self Church. And, and this, this source said that roughly 50% of all conversions to Christianity in the previous 20 years have been due to what they said, what they called faith healing experiences. Another source affiliated with the house churches, the, the unofficial churches, uh, in rural areas suggested that the numbers could be as high as 90%. Now, I have no way of knowing you know, what the actual percentage was. And again, the, the statistics I gave earlier, you know, those can be disputed in terms of exact figures. But the point is, we are talking about hundreds of millions of people worldwide, because the first figures were only from 10, 10 nations. And in some nations, we're talking about millions of people changing centuries of their ancestral allegiances and beliefs on some points to follow Jesus because they believe that Jesus uh, has done something that can't be easily explained in another way. There's no way I'm going to, I can't interview hundreds of millions of people, but I, I've interviewed uh, a lot of people. <laughs> and came up with a range of reports, including instantaneous healings of blindness, deafness, and people being raised from the dead, who were dead, as far as anybody could tell, they were dead for hours. There, there are miracles that have had medical documentation. Southern Medical Journal published an article in September of 2010. Um, there was another article in British Medical Journal back in the 80s. Many of the cases where I have eyewitness reports are from parts of the world where people didn't have access to medical help. Consequently, there's no medical documentation. Um, I think maybe miracles happened for them because they desperately needed them. But there are other places where we do have medical documentation. I was a police officer for 15 years, majoring in narcotics enforcement and during that nar narcotics enforcement exposed myself to tremendous amounts of violence, hardcore pornography. I was just a very hard, callous man. It cost me my first marriage as I put in my entire life into that career. I was also a deputy medical examiner, frequently seeing, having to, to view autopsies, unattended deaths, violent deaths through motor vehicle accidents or whatever violence may be it man does to man. My brain was filled with all of that stuff. Gave up that career after that 15 years and went on to driving truck, which lasted about six months driving cross country. I began noticing a loss of vision. Went to an eye doctor and was examined and diagnosed with macular degeneration, which my vision went from 2020 down to about 2400 in a very short time and was deemed legally blind, not only legally, but literally blind. I couldn't see. I was on disability, was looking at disability for the rest of my life, was sent to the Oregon Commission for the Blind and went through the full training to be a functional blind man, the white canyon training and the guide dog and everything there was to that. At that same time in that area, er, that area of time I met my current wife, Wendy, who was a born again, again on fire believer in Jesus Christ who recognized 
what I was going through and drug me with her to church where I was introduced to Jesus Christ and had an opportunity in 2001 to, to attend a men's retreat which was the topic was cleansing of the mind. I recognized I needed that. I couldn't sleep nights with the horrid graphic nightmares that I would constantly had. Closing my eyes with these visions of the violence, the pornography, the bodies was just overwhelming. I'd wake up screaming at night with these nightmares. I needed that. My prayer in that men's retreat was, Lord, cleanse my mind. Take this junk away. Set me free. I shortly after praying that felt the Lord telling me, you're clean. I opened my eyes and lo and behold, at the back of the stage where I sat in this chapel, I could see a tiny sign that said, red exit. And at that point realized I had been cleansed of my sin, but I also been healed and my vision had been totally restored. Uh, being on disability, I now had to get off of disability. Going to the state to tell them I'm no longer disabled, I can see. Opened a one year long investigation, which the state concluded after numerous medical exams with a letter that was given to them by the professional eye doctor was that there had been a remarkable healing, a miraculous healing. This is some of the medical records that we received from Oregon Health Sciences University, from Dr. Brad Seeley, dated uh, May 21st of 1999, when we first began my case, documenting the loss of visual acuity. There's even the graph of both eyes, as he did, showing where the vision loss was in both left and the right eye with all his notations on it, uh, all the documentation of loss of vision, uh, going up and up and up, all of the documentation from him. Uh, I don't have it out, but I do have documentation from the local doctor, as well as the letter from Dr. Burpee, clearing me of the investigation with the state of fraud. There was evidence of macular degeneration, but that it was healed and the scar tissue had been restored. No explanation of how that could be other than it was remarkable. It seems to me that you get to a point where it strains credibility, where a person is willing to call everybody liars or willing to attribute to coincidence something that is so statistically improbable, cumulatively speaking, that it makes you wonder why they hold so tenaciously to a philosophical premise inherited from a philosopher a few centuries ago, David Hume, that they're not willing to be open to this kind of evidence. There was a professor that I <clears throat> had wonderful dialogues with, but he would challenge my, my faith in God uh, a number of times. And <clears throat> on one occasion, I, I finally asked him, if somebody were raised from the dead in front of you, would you believe? He said, no. And I asked him, you have the audacity to call me closed-minded simply because I'm a Christian? When the Bible talks about the coming of the Messiah, the coming of this one who would be a redeemer, it, it really shows that this is not just a book of human wisdom and human inspiration, but this is a book inspired by God himself. The Gospel writers appealed to two areas of Jesus' life to establish his Messiahship, his resurrection and fulfilled messianic prophecy. The Old Testament is a collection of writings from the ancient Israelites, including the five books of Moses, historical books, wisdom books, and the books of the prophets. These scriptures were written over a thousand year period, completed more than 400 years prior to the life of Christ, and contain over 300 prophecies about the coming Messiah. 
All of these predictions were fulfilled in Jesus, and they establish a solid confirmation of his credentials as the Messiah. You know, we could try to prove the Bible's Word of God by, by uh, going to archaeology and uh, science and historical records and so forth. And those, all, those are all good because all of those things, frankly, do confirm. But God never appealed to those things. The one thing he appealed to to prove that his word was his word was, I can tell the future. Can you? You know, you can't, can you? My prophets can't. That's because they really are speaking for me, so believe it. And that's what God says in Isaiah 41. Other writings that claim to be holy writings from God, they just lack that one important feature. And that's supernatural credentials. <laughs> but fulfilled prophecy is a supernatural credential. If we go back to the very, very early parts of the Bible, about 4,000 years ago, we see that when God chose this man, Abram, just some obscure guy living in a tent and traveling, and tells him that through his seed, through his offspring, the whole world will be blessed. That's pretty remarkable. Pretty remarkable that through this one seed, Abram, then you have the children of Israel, and then through the children of Israel, you have Jesus the Messiah. Fascinating that these words spoken 4,000 years ago actually came to pass. When, when we move things up, oh, say about a thousand years uh, to the time of, of David, we have prophecies over him that, that there will be one that comes forth from his loins, one of his descendants who will be both a king and a priest. And as, as a priest, he'll deal with sin. As a priest, he'll, he'll bring mediation between God and man. And of course, we see a thousand years later, Jesus, the Messiah, coming into the world and doing this very thing. You say, oh, that's a spiritual thing. How, you can, how can you weigh that? Well, there are hundreds of millions of people around the world who say, yes, it, it had that effect in my life. We can go back, oh, about 1,400 years where Moses says that there'll be a prophet raised up like him who'll speak the words of God to the people of Israel. And there were many prophets that did that, but not on the level of a Moses. Jesus comes into the world, he prophesies that the temple would be destroyed. It was one of the great wonders of the ancient world. Herod had expanded it, and it was this gorgeous, large structure, these massive stones. The idea of it being destroyed was unthinkable. Jesus said it's going to be destroyed and leveled, completely leveled. And, and it, it happened. So Jesus, the prophet like Moses, is prophesied 1,400 years in advance and then speaks prophetic words like no one else ever spoke. This could go back to David. This could go back a thousand years before the time of Jesus, so 3,000 years ago. We don't know exactly when, but there is, there's a psalm of a suffering righteous person in Psalm 22. It's ascribed to David in the superscription, and it speaks of one who seems to be rejected by God, who's surrounded by hostile enemies, and it may even say in the Hebrew that his hands and feet are pierced through. The fact is it speaks of one basically hung out to dry, mocked, people looking at this one, hanging there, all their bones out of joint, people saying, where's your God? Go ahead, where's your God? Where is he to save you? The person's garments are divided up. It's an amazing picture of what really looks like crucifixion. Now, here's what's fascinating. Crucifixion was unknown at that time. Crucifixion was invented by the Persians several hundred years later. And then the Greeks learned it from the Persians and the Romans learned it from the Greeks. And that's how it was practiced in Jesus' day. And it was ultimately considered bar so barbaric that the Romans ultimately outlawed it, if you can imagine that. So here we have a picture that really looks like a crucifixion. But then it goes further. This one is delivered from the jaws of death here in Psalm 22. And not only delivered from the jaws of death, but what happens is his deliverance is so great that it brings praise to God to the ends of the earth. Think, hmm, can I think of anyone who was crucified, who was delivered from the jaws of death, and his, and his deliverance is so great that it's brought praise to the God of Israel to the ends of the earth? Fascinating. There are, there are prophecies that speak of him being rejected by his own people, Israel, and yet being a light to the entire world. These are spoken by Isaiah probably between five and 700 years before the time of Jesus in terms of when they're actually recorded and, and passed on. And Isaiah 53, one starts off by asking, who's believed our report? 
who's believed this message that we have? And this one, this servant, he's, he's going to seem so insignificant, just grow up out of nothing. And when we read about his origins, Jesus Yeshua comes from Galilee, small town Nazareth. The Messiah is going to come from there. You got to be kidding me. Now he's going to be Jerusalem and he's going to be famous and great teacher. He's a carpenter's son. Grows up in obscurity. And then, as his ministry develops, he begins to identify with the sick, the suffering, the hurting, the outcast. The prophet says he's intimately acquainted with sickness. He begins to take the pain, the, the sin of the people on his own shoulders and ultimately dies for our sins. And Isaiah 53, the people of Israel say, we thought he was dying for his sins. We thought he was suffering for his transgressions. Then we find out, we come to realize, no, he was dying for us. The sickness he bore, the sin, the pain he carried, it was ours. It wasn't his. And they make this great confession. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one has turned to his own way, but the Lord has laid on him, Jesus, Yeshua, the iniquity of us all. So it talks about his death. It talks about his burial. And then it says that, that he will see light or he will see the light of life. Dead Sea Scrolls has an expanded reading there, the most ancient manuscripts we have of Isaiah 53. How do you die? How are you cut off from the land of the living? How do you suffer a stroke for the, for the people, uh, a stroke of judgment for the people of God? How can all this be true? You're wounded, you're bruised, you die. It even speaks of him dying a violent death. It's plural in the Hebrew. It speaks of a violent death. And yet he sees the light of life. We call that resurrection. Furthermore, the Old Testament prophets recorded specific details about the Messiah's ministry, that his ministry would begin in Galilee, that it would be a ministry of miracles, that he would be preceded by a messenger, that he would be a teacher of parables, that he was to enter the temple, and that he was to enter Jerusalem riding on a donkey. Here we have pretty direct, straightforward, predictive prophecy and its fulfillment. But there are other passages where a New Testament writer says, thus is fulfilled what the Lord said through such and such a prophet. And you go back and you say, doesn't seem to match all that well. Out of Egypt, I have called my son, Hosea 11.1, 1, and you read it in context, and Hosea is talking about the Exodus, and the son is the children of Israel being brought out of Egypt. But the very fact that it doesn't match all that well is also an important observation. It means the Gospel writers did not comb the Old Testament looking for something that the Messiah was supposed to do and then make it up and attribute it to Jesus. What they did was recognize things that Jesus really did once they were convinced he was the Messiah on other straightforward grounds and using a very common Jewish and Greek device of the day called typology, saw striking parallels to the actions in Jesus' life of statements about Old Testament events and characters. And in a worldview in which God existed and superintended providentially the affairs of humanity, to see that Moses had to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt to the promised land at the time they were given the covenant that we now call the Old Testament and then to see that the Messiah had to flee to and therefore be led out of Egypt to the land of Israel which was the promised land at the time of the giving of the new covenant was way too coincidental to be random. It had to be the sign of a sovereign God at work in discernible patterns, just as powerful as direct predictive prophecy. Let me talk about what the skeptics think about the prophecies about Jesus. One of them is that Jesus knew the prophecies. And in order to convince people that he was the Messiah, though he wasn't, 
any more than anyone else was. He just was a guy who wanted to convince people he was a Messiah. He engineered things so that he did some of the things the prophet said he, the Messiah would do. He rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. Anyone could do that. There are things Jesus did that a person could, in fact, plan to do. If he wanted to say, okay, I want people to think I'm the Messiah. There's this prophecy here. I can do that. I'll make that happen. And, and lots of skeptics say that's what happened. You, you say Jesus fulfilled prophecy. Well, any, Jesus knew the prophecies. He could do them. But they're not aware of the nature of the prophecies that he fulfilled and the impossibility of someone doing them on purpose. For example, being born in Bethlehem. Whoever had a choice about where they're going to be born. Or Daniel's prophecy about when the Messiah would come. Who had a choice about when they'd be born. Concerning Jesus' birth, Isaiah prophesied of the virgin birth of Christ, which the Gospel writers recorded as this miraculous event was fulfilled with Jesus' mother Mary. Within the book of Genesis and the prophets are prophecies that the Messiah would be a descendant of Abraham, a descendant of Isaac, a descendant of Jacob, and of the tribe of Judah, from the family line of Jesse and of the house of David all of which Luke documented the fulfillments when he provided a detailed genealogy of Christ within his gospel. Obviously, things like that are things that happen to somebody, not something that people engineer. I mean, that he was betrayed for 30 pieces of silver or crucified or any of the things that we recognize as fulfillments of prophecy in his life. Almost all of them are things that a man didn't have any power over. But there's another even more important argument against that skeptical issue. Jesus does not act like a man who's trying to convince people that he's the Messiah. As a matter of fact, if he was, he would have done other things because the Jews were looking for the Messiah not to do the things he did, but to do things that he never attempted to do. They expected the Messiah to raise an army of Israelites against the Romans. That's the one thing that the Jews were willing to believe a Messiah would do. When he fed the 5,000 in John 6, verse 15, it says, when Jesus knew that the crowds were about to take him by force and make him king. That is, force him into the role of Messiah. He withdrew and went to a mountain alone to pray and sent the crowds away. He, he did not accommodate the people's expectations of the Messiah. And that's why they abandoned him to be crucified. He just wasn't the Messiah they were looking for. So Jesus' fulfillment of prophetic scripture, insofar as we can establish that he did so, and we can on many points, uh, was, was strictly because he, in fact, was the predicted Messiah, not because he was trying to pretend to be. So you've got a number of prophecies in advance laying out the, the broad strokes of his ministry in some cases, laying out his death and resurrection, laying out some specifics of those. Some are a thousand years in advance, some are 700 years in advance, some 500 years in advance. And then we have three prophecies, Haggai, who prophesies a little over 500 years before the time of Jesus, who says the glory of the second temple will be greater than the glory of the first. Malachi, who prophesies about 400 years before the time of Jesus, saying that the Lord himself will visit the second temple. And then Daniel, prophesying again about 500 years before the time of Jesus, speaking of how atonement for sin will be made and everlasting righteousness brought in before the second temple was destroyed. In other words, these momentous things have to happen before the second temple is destroyed, and they're prophesied between four and 500 years before the time of Jesus. And sure enough, Jesus comes and fulfills those things, and the second temple is destroyed in the year 70, which means if he isn't the Messiah, there never will be, will be one. Conversely, because he did these things, we know the prophetic words are true. Is the resurrection of Jesus the best established explanation of the events recorded in the Gospels? Such as the disciples' experiences of Jesus' appearances and the discovery of the empty tomb. The resurrection of Jesus and Christianity stand or fall together. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is vain. Your faith also is vain. Paul went on to affirm that Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. 
If we just let the New Testament speak for itself, it's pretty clear that the resurrection is at the very center of faith. There's a lot of ways you can tell that. But for example, in the Gospels, when Jesus is asked, give us a sign, how do we know that you're the Messiah? On at least three different occasions, he points to his resurrection. Well, there are several times in the Gospels in which Jesus predicts his death and resurrection. And historians, we're limited to things that we can prove. There are some things that ancient reports uh, include about Jesus, or any ancient figure for that matter. And it, for all we know, it could be true, but it may not be. We, we look for multiple independent sources. We look for eyewitness, early sources, unsympathetic sources, hostile sources, things like this. When it comes to Jesus' predictions about his death and resurrection, um, there are some of these predictions that Jesus make within the Gospels that are a little more strongly evidenced than others. So for example, in Mark chapter 8, this is the story where Jesus says, I'm going to be killed, I'm going to be crucified, and then three days later I'm going to rise from the dead. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke this word openly. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when he had turned around and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Now, historians can look at this and say there are a number of, of things in this verse that seem to suggest that this is an authentic saying of Jesus. One of those would be the criterion of embarrassment. Why, if you were going to invent this kind of prediction, Jesus predicting his death and resurrection, why would you have Jesus rebuking the leader of the church? Why not make it a minor disciple or someone? Why make it Peter, your lead apostle? Peter has the audacity to rebuke his Lord, and then Jesus turns around and rebukes the leader of his church. This isn't the kind of stuff that you make up. One strongly evidenced historical claim of the Gospels is that Jesus really died by crucifixion. Crucifixion in antiquity was perhaps the most brutal way of dying. It was almost always preceded by some form of torture. In the case of the Romans, what they typically did was they scourged a person. You could even scourge a person to death. It was, uh, it was so horrible that um, Seneca, at the end of the first century, a Roman philosopher said uh, that a person on the cross looked maimed misshapen, deformed, and nailed, and drawing the breath of life amid long, drawn-out agony. When we talk about reasons for the death of Jesus, you know, for those who ask questions, how do we know he died, and so on, there's several different areas we can go. One is medical science. From what we know about crucifixion, still the most common medical reason given for crucifixion is that on the cross you die by asphyxiation. Now it's not unanimous, but that's still the majority medical view. And if that's true, there are built-in checks and balances in crucifixion. You don't have to be a medical doctor. All you have to do is walk by and see if this person on the cross is hanging in the low position. Because if they're gonna speak, or if they're gonna breathe, or if they're gonna live, you have to push up. Because when you hang down, your body constricts the muscles, intercostal pectoral deltoid muscles, constrict around your uh, lungs. It was easy to inhale, it was difficult to exhale. And so the tendency would be to have carbon dioxide build up, which uh, would cause all sorts of seizures and convulsions and be very painful. But in order to expel the carbon dioxide, you had to push up on your nail-pierced feet to expel it and then go back down because it was too painful to be on the nail-pierced feet, all your weight on that and then very shallow breathing until you had to expel the carbon dioxide. So if you're up, you're alive, maybe talking and breathing. But if you're down for any amount of time, you've probably slumped into a coma, you've passed out because you can't breathe increasingly in the down position. So if you're down for a half hour, I mean, what I'm saying is you don't have to have any medical treatment at all to know when a person's dead on the cross if, if this is true because you'd slump down in the down position, you'd be dead. We only have one account in antiquity of a person surviving crucifixion. 
in one of Josephus' writings, he mentions three of his friends being crucified. He saw it during the fall of Jerusalem. And so he ran to his friend, the Roman commander Titus, who ordered that all three be removed immediately as a favor to Josephus and given the best medical care Rome had to offer. So, but in spite of this, two of the three still died. So your chances of surviving crucifixion were, were almost zero unless someone had removed you prematurely and intentionally tried to restore you to health. But even then, you had a two out of three chance that you weren't going to make it. Secondly, we know that very frequently they uh, gave death blows to the person who was on the cross. It's sort of like, uh, you're not faking on my watch, and you do something to them. Now, we have, we have the case in the Gospels of them breaking the legs of the two men on each side of Jesus. We have some cases outside the Gospels of breaking legs. We find those a couple of times. And the Gospel we've, and of John, they come to Jesus and they don't break his legs because he's already dead. Now, see, even when you say, how does a Roman soldier know he's already dead? Well, you're hanging low and you're not making a sound. You can't breathe in that position. So what do they do? Well, again, not on my watch, so they didn't break his legs. Because breaking legs, that's another indication of asphyxiation. You make the guy stay down in the low position. So they stabbed him with the spear. We have two sources outside the Gospel of John that tell us that stabbing with the spear is an option. We also have accounts where a guy was had a skull crushed with a, with a club to make sure that he didn't get off the cross alive. We have another one where a guy's threatened with a bow and arrow. This is the, the Gospels, everything they describe about the crucifixion, the scourging beforehand, the being impaled, um, the breaking of legs. I mean, you break the legs in Jerusalem because Josephus reports that prior to the fall of Jerusalem, the Romans allowed Jews in Jerusalem to remove the crucified prior to sunset. So different than it was throughout the Roman Empire, they would allow the Jews to remove people prior to sunset and give them a proper burial. So everything the Gospels report about crucifixion in the process is very compatible and right in line with what we also read in secular history of the period. Another strongly evidenced historical claim of the Gospels is that Jesus' tomb was empty three days after his burial. We know that the early Christians were proclaiming in Jerusalem that Jesus had been raised from the dead. Not only do we find this in the Gospels, we also find it in the writings of the Roman historian Tacitus from the early second century. It says that after Pilate crucified Jesus, that the evil and mischievous superstition broke out again in Judea where it started. Jerusalem's in Judea. How is it that you can proclaim the resurrection of Jesus if his, in Jerusalem if his body is still in the tomb? Because all the enemies, the Jews wouldn't have done it probably, but the Romans, they could have had the Romans do it. Just go to the tomb and make sure the body's in there. And any body that even resembled the stature of Jesus would have been devastating to the early Christians. But it seems like they weren't able to do that. In fact, the only thing that we have coming from the earliest uh, times would have been recorded in Matthew, who's, which is written in the first century, somewhere between the 60s or 50s and the 80s. And he reports that the Jewish leaders were going around saying that the disciples stole the body. Now, why do you say the disciples stole the body if it's still in the tomb? This is just a, a, a reason for explaining why the tomb was empty. There is a surprising amount of evidence that the tomb in which Jesus was buried was empty. In fact, in surveying critical scholarship to come up with this list of facts that people agree to, uh, I have found 23 different arguments for the empty tomb which critical scholars use. 23 arguments. When I went to graduate school in the 70s, almost nobody admitted the empty tomb. If you did, you were an evangelical. You had to be conservative. Almost nobody else admitted the empty tomb. Today, about two-thirds to three-quarters of scholars believe in the empty tomb. It's really come up in value. Now, here's what the, to me, what, why the, this is important. The empty tomb does not require a resurrection, right? Other things could have happened. But it's a good indicator of a couple things. Number one, it's one of many considerations in favor of a resurrection. It could be something else, but if the alternative theories don't work, and they don't, like the disciples stole the body, which critics don't even take today, it's such a bad theory. 
uh, because main reason being you don't die for something you don't believe in. So the, it's an evidence, a major evidence for the resurrection. But one other thing, the empty tomb shows that what happened to Jesus concerned his body. That's very important because the Jewish view is the pri the primary Jewish view, the predominant Jewish view is resurrection of the body. And the empty tomb says that since the body was gone, whatever happened to him happened to his body. It wasn't a glorified spirit, although he was really raised from the dead. No, because the body still would have been in the tomb. So we have good evidence for it, but it's also a good, it's a good indication that Jesus was raised and that he was raised bodily. Even critical scholars concede that the disciples really believed that they saw the risen Jesus because there is so much evidence in favor of these events. The fact that the disciples really believe that Jesus was raised from the dead is indicated by, by several important signs. But let me first say that virtually the entire critical community concedes this without any arguments. Um, there's almost no one who will argue that the disciples did not believe that Jesus appeared to them. I mean, you almost, you could basically count on one hand people who won't concede this. Okay, so now you say, well, why did they concede that? Well, one of the first reasons is, is they were willing to die. We have no less than 11 ancient sources that report that the disciples of Jesus and Paul were willing to suffer continuously and even willing to die a martyr's death for their gospel proclamation, their belief that Jesus had died for their sins and had been raised from the dead. Now you have people like Luke, Tertullian, John, Dionysus of Corinth, Origen, Polycarp, Ignatius, and Clement of Rome all report these things in terms of just the disciples. Forget Paul, you got seven there, seven or eight that just talk about the willingness of disciples to suffer and even die for their beliefs. Now it doesn't mean we've got early testimony that they all died for their beliefs. We know that they all were willing to die for their beliefs. We all that we know that they all suffered for their beliefs. We can establish historically that Peter died uh, as a martyr. Paul died as a martyr. James, the half brother of Jesus, died as a martyr. And I think we've got good evidence that John the apostle died as a martyr. Why are you willing to die? leave your family, leave your business, unless you really believe what you're teaching. You would have to have severe mental problems, you would think, for a person to do all those things and not believe what they're talking about. And then have nobody recant later, have nobody say, well, it was all a joke, or I tried to be part of this, but I can't be part of it anymore. Nothing like that. But I just think their sold outness, their willingness to preach and give everything for it, and then be willing to die, those are knockout reasons to believe they, that they were really convinced of this. Scholars acknowledge the historical facts of Jesus' existence, his death by crucifixion, the empty tomb, and that the disciples were really convinced they saw the risen Jesus. In spite of these facts, several non-miraculous theories have been offered as alternative explanations to what happened at Jesus' tomb, the most popular being the hallucinations theory. Today, if I had to guess, I would say the most popular response for people who don't want to believe in the resurrection is that the early disciples saw hallucinations. And I think that this is highly problematic because our earliest accounts that critics accept, for example, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, has three group appearances listed there. Jesus appeared to the twelve. He appeared to all the apostles. He appeared to 500 brethren. He appeared to 500 men. In other words, that group could have been much larger. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve, after that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, he appeared to me also. Maybe the most interesting thing about that tradition at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 15 is, um, what it does not say is, he died, he was buried according to the scriptures, he rose, and then people saw him. What it says is, he appeared to this person. He appeared to 
that person. It's an active verb indicating that Jesus himself took the initiative to appear to certain people. Now, that's not the language of I saw in a dream or a vision. That's objective language rather than subjective language. And in that list of those to whom he appeared, at least two of those people were not even followers of Jesus at all. One would be James, his brother. The other would be Paul at the bottom of the list, who was not only not a follower, he was an antagonist to the movement. So you have appearances to those who had been followers. You have appearances to those who were family but didn't really believe in Jesus. And then you have appearance to somebody who was the enemy of the early Jesus movement. Uh, well, that's pretty remarkable. And in each case, we hear he appeared, he appeared, and last of all, he appeared to me. That's very striking evidence. So the problem with hallucinations is that uh, nowhere in the literature, I've got a clinical psychologist friend who did an in-depth literature search, nowhere in the literature are there documented cases of group hallucinations. And so therefore, when you say that these are individual events, group appearances are highly problematic. But they're not, that's not the only problem. The empty tomb with 23 evidences in its favor, hallucination is, an, is a full tomb view not an empty tomb view. That body should have been in the tomb if there's an hallucination, but the body's not in the tomb, saying something happened to the body. That says something happened to the body. The empty tomb is a real problem for hallucination. Another thing is hallucinations almost never transform a life where the person never rethinks it. I know some actual hallucination accounts where people are talked out of them very easily, and you go, oh, well that didn't happen, and the guy goes, how do you know? And you go, because I was there. And he goes, oh, I must have been making it up. What I mean is you can, you can almost always talk them out of it, and it doesn't send them out preaching and caught, doing this and doing that. The fact that nobody ever recanted among the disciples, nobody rethought it, nobody, you know. But maybe the biggest problem of all for hallucinations is how many different persons, times, and places are claiming to see the risen Jesus. Hallucinations are person-dependent. Some people are prone to see them, some people aren't. The most likely group to experience a hallucination are senior adults bereaving the loss of a loved one. And of those, approximately 7% experience a visual hallucination of that loved one they're grieving over. That's the highest percentage. In the case of the apostles, we're talking about not 7%, but 100%. He appeared to the 12. He appeared to all the apostles, according to the earliest reports. So that's 100%, not 7%. That's unheard of within the medical literature, that's in psychology, that specializes in things like this. So it's very implausible. Uh, you really have to stretch to make that happen. The hallucination hypothesis also doesn't account um, for the appearance to Paul or to James. They're not believers, right? So they're not wanting to see Jesus. The conversion of Paul is of great interest. It, it would be something that skeptics would love if we didn't have it, <laughs> because it's probably the strongest uh, point in terms of the evidence for the resurrection. There's a lot of other stuff, but Paul, he's a key. And the reason he's so important is because he was not a follower of Jesus at the time of his experience. In fact, he was a persecutor of the church. Jesus was the last person in the world that Paul wanted to see. Here's a man who's anti-Christian, vehemently anti-Christian, persecuting Christians, throwing them in jail. He goes off on an assignment to arrest Christians in another country, which he's doing with great fervor and great zeal. And it gets to his destination, he's now preaching the gospel. What happened? There's only two possible things that could have happened. One is what he said happened, and the other is he's lying about what happened. But the problem is nothing about his later life supports that thesis. You know, I mean, the guy never did, you know, arrest those leaders. Instead, he got arrested himself, beaten and imprisoned and uh, eventually beheaded for his faith. Not the kind of stuff that people do when they're generally faking a conversion. They don't usually go all the way like that. But more than that, what we have to remember is that when Paul first got saved and came back to Jerusalem a few years later, the apostles there 
had that very suspicion about him. Says they didn't believe he was a disciple. They were afraid of him. Words, they had heard his story too, but they thought he was lying. But they changed their mind, which was a very risky thing for them to do. Really risky, because he wasn't just claiming to be a Christian. Now, let's face it, if he was a fake and he was there to infiltrate and arrest them and destroy the movement, even trusting him to be a Christian would be risky. But more than that, he didn't claim he was a Christian, he claimed he was an apostle, <laughs> you know? Now, the guys least likely to go for that story are the apostles, because they're the, by definition, they're the leaders. But they let the stranger come in and claim that he's one of the leaders too. I mean, it's like me walking into a church I've never been in. They don't know me. And I say, hey, I'm one of the elders here. Yeah, I don't think they're going to buy that. You know, I'm in charge here. I'm one of the guys in charge of this church. And they've never even seen me before. It's, that's going to be a hard sell. And Paul's conversion and his apostleship was going to be a hard sell with the other apostles. But the interesting thing is, as you know, in Second Peter chapter 3, Peter, Peter, after knowing Paul for decades at that time, said that Paul was a beloved brother and wrote scripture. If someone wants to question Paul's genuineness, one thing they just have to deal with that, that no, one, no one seriously doubts, and that that man was once a Pharisee who hated Christianity, and on a particular journey to Damascus, he changed and became one who claimed to be a Christian. Now we can say his story is true, and that fits all the evidence afterwards. Or we can say his, his, his story was false, and then we have no way of explaining the evidence afterwards. I mean, his, his genuine conversion, the power, the miracles working just like we're going through Peter and James and John. In other words, if someone's really interested in evidence and doesn't have a foregone conclusion against Paul, they're gonna to have to buy it. They're gonna to have to buy his story because there's not an alternative that really works at all. The conversion of James, the skeptical half-brother of Jesus, is, is important too. I mean, here we've got all four Gospels report that Jesus had brothers. Um, two of them, Mark and John, report that Jesus' brothers didn't believe in him. But somehow they came to believe that their brother was the Messiah, was the Son of God. Now what would it take to convince you that your brother is the Lord? And yet this is what convinced them. Most scholars would believe that it's an appearance to James that led to his transformation from being a skeptic to now someone who becomes a leader of the Jerusalem church. And according to Josephus, a Jewish historian, Clement of Alexandria, and uh, Hegesippus, they all report that um, James, the half-brother of Jesus, died the death of a martyr. He was stoned. There is much we can know about Jesus historically, and the first century Gospels preserved by the Church remain by far the best sources for this information. The portrayal of Jesus in the Gospels, dependent on eyewitness testimony, is more plausible than the alternative hypotheses of its modern detractors. That if they're going to be a fair-minded, honest historian, then they will first have to recognize that there is an irreducible amount of evidence about the historical Jesus that is not explained by just explaining it away and saying, well, it doesn't exist or it doesn't matter. That does not explain the rise of Christianity. What even the secular historian most of the time admits is you have to account for the rise of this remarkable movement that really changed the Roman Empire and then in various ways the whole Western world as well as other parts of the world as well. You have to give a large enough an account of the origins, the genesis of this early Christian movement that adequately explains where did it come from and how did it arise. And most historians would say it would never have arisen at all if there had never been a historical Jesus and if he hadn't been a very significant person that uh, made a big impact on his disciples. If the size of the impact crater on the earliest disciples is large, then you have to assume that the presence of the figure who made that impact was significant and, and large indeed. They weren't looking for this event to happen. Their dreams were crushed when Jesus was executed as a, a criminal. They were hiding behind locked doors for fear that they would be next to be arrested. 
You can't call it late legend because it developed almost immediately. And if it's all made up, why do all four gospel writers seemingly independently of each other create women as the first eyewitnesses when women's testimony, with rare exceptions, wasn't admitted in a court of law? Why would a new Jewish movement make up this idea about a crucified and resurrected Messiah? It seems highly historically improbable. If it wasn't grounded in something that actually happened to Jesus of Nazareth at the end of his life. And in an honor and shame culture, since crucifixion was the most shameful way to die, um, something had to happen to Jesus after crucifixion that was so significant that it made for a total reversal of the verdict on Jesus once he was crucified. Uh, how did it happen that people thought, thought of him as the Son of God or the risen Savior or the Lord after he was crucified if nothing whatsoever happened to him after he was laid in the grave? Well, I, I think most historians would say that's pretty inexplicable. All kinds of insuperable problems admit and obtain unless we say maybe Jesus was raised from the dead. One can finally ask the question about all of this stuff. So what? What does this matter uh, if the Gospels are historically reliable? It now raises the question of what did he do and say? What is the basic message of the Gospel of Jesus Christ? And what bearing does it have for us as human beings? The Jesus of Testimony the Lord Jesus Christ died for our sins, was laid in a tomb, and on the third day he was raised. The Bible says, Jesus God has exalted to his right hand to be Prince and Savior, to give repentance and forgiveness of sins. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all people everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. I think we have a pretty tight argument that the resurrection evidences the teachings of Jesus. In the resurrection, we see God's approval of the teachings of Jesus. His number one teaching was the kingdom of God and how to get there. That was his number one teaching. When Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God in Mark chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, it says Jesus came into all Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God, saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Re re believe the good news. What good news? That the kingdom of God was at hand, that what he just preached, the gospel of the kingdom. Now when Mark begins his gospel, he begins the gospel in chapter 1, verse 1, saying the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then he tells the whole story of Jesus Christ with an emphasis on his passion and his resurrection. Of course, uh, all the gospels emphasize his passion, his death and resurrection. It's very important, obviously, a very uh, essential core issue of the gospel. But it's not the whole gospel because the whole gospel of Mark is the gospel. The whole story of Jesus is the gospel and the story of Jesus in a certain context of what God was doing. The word gospel means good news, good tidings. Now Jesus' gospel was, here's the good news I've got for you. The kingdom of God is at hand. So Jesus announces that God has broken into the world. When, with the coming of Jesus, we have the planting of the mustard seed of the kingdom. Jesus says the kingdom is like a mustard seed, the smallest of all seeds that he knew of. And, and yet when it grows, it takes over the whole garden. That's the kingdom of God. And so his life, his death, and his resurrection is the birth of this movement. When you look at Jesus, you're seeing what it looks like when God reigns uh, in a human life. When God totally, 100% rules a human being, what do they look like? Well, they look like Jesus. They look like somebody who would wash the feet of his disciples. You look like Jesus who gives his life for his enemies. The very people who are crucifying him. The kingdom that Jesus brings, it looks like 
uh, perfect self-sacrificial love. It looks like servanthood. It looks like humility coming under people. It is not at all what any Jew of the first century expected. For centuries, uh, Israel had not been a sovereign nation, and they saw it as an insult to God. Here they are, they believe in the one true God, and yet these pagans are ruling them. And they were oppressed, and so they were calling out for deliverance. Uh, and everyone was expected a, a Davidic Messiah, a Messiah like David, to be a warrior, and uh, would, would, would use supernatural power to crush their enemies. And Jesus comes, and he says, love your enemies. Turn the other cheek. Bless those who persecute you. You know, feed those who are hungry. Care for those who are homeless. And it's not what anyone expected to hear. And it's not what anyone wanted to hear. That's why it's not surprising that Peter, when they come to arrest Jesus, Peter takes out a sword and starts, that's, he, I'm sure he thought that this would, and now Jesus would finally rise up and show us true colors and the legions of angels would come and give them victory. Instead, Jesus rebukes Peter, says, put away that sword. And then he heals the guy's ear. He's saying, this is how we do warfare in the kingdom of God. Not with a sword. We do it not by beating up our enemies. We do it by praying for the healing of our enemies. That's the beauty of the kingdom of God. The coming of God's kingdom is good news for some, but it's bad news for those who aren't ready. You know, one thing that, that we have in common, regardless of our religious beliefs, if we're atheists, if we're Muslims, if we're Christians, if we're Jews, we're all human beings. We all live, we're going to die. We know our frailty in that sense. And if we're honest, we also know our, our sin. I'm not talking about based on someone's religious beliefs. I mean, based on what we know is right. No, you're not a sinner only if you're shooting heroin and robbing some poor old widow and raping helpless victims and dropping bombs on innocent civilians. No, those are things that sinful people do that may be more obvious. But every one of us, judged by God's perfect standards, every one of us falls short. And when we recognize the standards, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, strength, love your neighbor as yourself, then just the selfishness that we tend to walk in and the pride that we tend to walk in and the fact that we put our energy and love towards so many other things aside from God, that condemns us right there. We haven't even talked about don't commit adultery, which means don't even have adulterous thoughts. Or don't commit murder, which could even mean don't have hateful thoughts towards others. We haven't even gone through that. So universally, we all fall short. This is God's answer. He sends his son into the world, the only one that's perfectly righteous. That's why he was virgin born. That's why he came down from above. He sends his son into the world, perfect, pure, clean, never sins. And his son says, I'll take the sin. I'll take the guilt. He came and died for the sins of humanity and uh, therefore made it possible for God's estranged people to be reconciled to God. Now, that's far more than just being a good teacher. That's far more than just being a miracle worker. Um, that's a changing of the direction of a fallen world full of evil and wickedness. Jesus is not just a dusty figure from hoary antiquity that is an interesting historical study. Jesus is the risen Lord who today still confronts us about who we are and who we ought to be and what God had in mind for us. And that story will still teach and preach today. He says, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, that's the term the uh, emperors used. It's the term for Yahweh, God of Israel in the Old Testament. If you declare that Jesus is the supreme master of the universe and of your life, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. He's not just a great teacher that we follow. He was bodily raised from the dead you will be saved. I believe that Jesus took my place, died for my sins. When we truly turn to him, God, forgive me. Wash me clean. Give me a brand new start. That's what happens. Not only did Jesus die, he rose from the dead. And when we put our trust in him, we die with him to our sins and we rise in a brand new life. My own story is literally from LSD to PhD. 
I was shooting heroin. I was using hallucinogenic drugs. I was a, a wicked, rebellious kid and enjoying it. I thought I was cool. I was playing drums in a rock band. I was going to be a star. I had no intention of changing. And then God began to show me in my own heart the, the guilt of my sin. Began to show me just between the, the two of us, my guilt and the wrongness of what I had done. And when I realized Jesus died for me, when I realized that, how much God loved me, December 17th of 71, I said, that's it. I'll never put a needle in my arm again. And I was free from that day on. New life. I realized when he died, I died with him. And now I rose with him in new life where we serve God. When I came to Christ, I had been an atheist. As far as anybody knew, I was an atheist up until that day, although I'd started having considerable doubts. Maybe agnostic was a better way to put it at that point. But I heard the gospel, and it wasn't from people who actually could give me a very good argument for it, but they gave me the right content for it. Um, they didn't understand a lot of the things that we've talked about here but they knew the basic message that Jesus came to save us. And they hammered that home. And I said, I'm an atheist. I don't believe that. Why should I believe that? And I walked away. And God gave me a different kind of evidence, an evidence that maybe some of our listeners are feeling right now. God gave me the evidence of his own presence, his demands on me, a certainty that went beyond any other kind of evidence that I could have had because it came directly into my heart. God works with different people in different ways, but the way he worked with me that day, I walked home, I was so convicted by the Holy Spirit, I didn't have that wording back then to know what it was called. I struggled back and forth, but God was in the room with me, just as, just as real as anybody else could have been. And finally, my knees buckled out from under me, and I said, God, I don't understand this about how Jesus dying and rising from the dead, how that can save me. But God, if that's what you're saying, then I'll believe it. But God, they talked about being saved. They talked about being really right with you. I don't know how to do that. So if you want to do that for me, You'll have to do it yourself. And that was the beginning of my Christian life. But if God would take me, who knew almost nothing about Christianity, who, who had, you know, half of what I did know was incorrect, who had blasphemed God's name, who had spoken against him, if God would take me, God will take anybody who's just willing to accept the testimony of the Spirit. Jesus rose from the dead, and now Jesus is alive and is Lord of the universe and is ready to transform the life of whoever comes to him.